Deciding what you want to listen to during your workouts is sometimes very difficult. Whatever your auditory preferences are, Raycon's Everyday Earbuds are the perfect way to listen to your favorite tunes. I've personally been using Raycon's Earbuds since they sponsored me three years ago, and I wouldn't continue doing these promotions if I didn't stand by this product. Their audio quality rivals that of other premium brands at a price that your budget will love. So as you all may know, Mother's Day is right around the corner. Studies have proven the best way to celebrate Mother's Day is to tell her about my channel. And while you're at it, you can also tell her the best way to listen to my content is by using the Raycons that you bought for her. These studies were conducted by me, by the way. So you can definitely trust it. Click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com forward slash 522 and get 20% off your Raycon purchase plus free shipping. A big thanks to Raycon for sponsoring independent creators like me. And that's the bottom line, because Uncle Unit said so. I used to live in a shady as hell apartment complex in an otherwise rich suburban area for about three years. I have lots of stories I could share, but this one is about a neighbor who I'll call Bob. Here's a bit of backstory. I was 18 at the time, and my sister was 16. We used to babysit all the neighborhood kids together. These kids considered us their friends. It got to where they seemed to have a radar whenever me and my sister went outside. They would come out and talk to us, and we would let them ride our skateboards in the parking lot. These kids were between the ages of 8 and 13. So one day, we were outside with them, when we were joined by a stranger. He stood between us and our car. He introduces himself, then asks if we could sign a petition. We wanted to be friendly, so we obliged. He then asks how old we were. I thought maybe he was a fellow teenager that looked a bit older than he actually was, and maybe he was just awkward. So I tell him that I'm 18, and the very next question was if I wanted to go out with him. It was really awkward. I politely declined, but he continued talking, going on about how he thought me and my sister were in middle school, and he also admitted that he was 28 years old. <laughs> wow. Eventually he wandered away, and asked somebody else to sign his stupid petition. A few days later, he knocked on our door. He found out where we lived by asking another neighbor for our address. He had a bag of what he said was chicken and wanted us to join him for lunch at the park. We declined because we both had schoolwork to do. He mumbled something about how everyone is so antisocial nowadays before he walks off. Later, we look out our window and see him playing baseball with two girls. He kept physically moving their arms into different positions, even though they kept brushing him away. The next day, one of the kids runs up to me. I'll call her Maddie. She was around eight years old. She got a new pair of Heelys and wanted me to help her with them. I was holding her hand and guiding her along when Bob appears and says that he could assist her better. Maddie tries to refuse him, but he insists. He pushed me aside and reaches for her, holding her tightly around the upper chest area. Her grandmother was there too and begins to flip out. He looks at us a bit confused, but eventually wanders away. The next day, Maddie was freaking out about something. She said that Bob 
was sitting on her porch when she was leaving for school. She immediately went back inside and told her parents. They went outside to confront him, but he somehow ended up in their kitchen to, and I quote, make orange chicken. We later heard a similar story from another neighbor. Not long after these incidents occurred, they were helping a family move out. They had a two-year-old son. They were moving out of one of three units that had a garage. They're in sort of a triangle formation facing the road, almost like a roundabout. Well, here comes Bob. He begins criticizing the way that we were packing things up. Our neighbor politely asked him to leave. But instead of walking away, he asked the two-year-old boy if he wanted to play. The kid said no, and that made Bob angry. He then bent down and picked him up and was immediately slapped across the face. I immediately took the kid away from Bob and guided him back to his mother. The climax of this story was when me and my sister went on a walk with our 17-year-old friend. Maddie noticed us and wanted to come along. So we're all just hanging out when Bob shows up. He then proceeds to ask our friend how old she is and how much she weighs. Before she could get a word out, he asks where we're heading. She told him that we were having a girl's day out and that we were going to get ice cream. We didn't want her to tell him anything. But in a surprising turn of events, he goes, Aw, oh, man, and stomps away. Crazy. We continue our walk, but about halfway through, we all get that weird feeling. I look behind us, and I see Bob sprinting toward us. He yells something about us hiding from him. Another neighbor sees this, and then asked him what was going on. He tells the man that we're being mean, and that he needs to go write a song about us. Everyone is looking at him like he has completely lost his mind, and he eventually scurries away. It's safe to say that Bob wasn't all there. Later on, we see him sitting in the park. When he sees us, he asked which one of us was over 18. Maddie's father happened to be with us at this point and tells him sternly that we're not interested in him. He then explodes, telling the dad to go fuck himself and that he was rude. He then turns to me and says, Bitch. Maddie starts crying. Other neighbors begin to notice the confrontation and Bob hurries inside, muttering to himself. For weeks afterward, we don't see him. In this time, we get new neighbors, a single dad and his five-year-old daughter. As we're introducing ourselves, my mother tips him off about Bob, saying that he's a bit nuts with questionable behavior, especially around children. The new neighbor says that he saw someone that fit that description. He was passing by the community pool, and there was a strange man there handing out candy to children who all looked very uncomfortable. In mid-conversation, as if on cue, here comes Bob. He immediately tells the girl, right in front of her dad, that she looks like a movie star. He then asks if he could play with her, but the dad says, Uh, fuck no. Get the hell out of here. It turns out these new tenants and Bob were next-door neighbors. We didn't see him much after that, but other neighbors were still telling stories about him. There was a mother who was by herself for most of the day with her two kids. Both of them were under five. She told us that he watches her whenever she goes to and from her car. Also, Maddie's parents continue to see him gawking at her. Then one day, we're babysitting again, and here he comes. Only this time, he was swinging a pair of nunchucks. Maddie screams and quickly hides in her car. Bob strolls over to us, still swinging his nunchucks, and starts talking to us all casual-like. He then cranes his head to look inside the car, then asks, Where's Maddie? We told him that we didn't know where she was. He stares at us, then walks away. By then, 
most of the kids were too afraid to even go outside whenever they saw him walking around. Until one day, he just stopped showing up. We would see who I assume was his dad and brother going in and out of his apartment all the time, but never him. We only saw him one more time around Christmas before he disappeared for good. I still don't know what happened to him. This was just one series of many bizarre occurrences that happened in the three years we stayed there. Obligatory Backstory There was a neighbor in the building across from mine, an older single woman named Susan. When me and my sister first moved in, we would hang out near her building sometimes, so we sort of developed a rapport with her. We would bring her tea when she was sick and walk her dog. I was next door neighbors with a different woman named Laura. Laura is the mother of two young kids, and she and her boyfriend liked to sit on their balcony overlooking the parking lot and smoke into the late hours of the night. One night at about 2 a.m., Laura texted my mom about something she saw in the parking lot. We all tend to stay up pretty late. My mom tells me and my sister, and we went to her balcony to see what was going on. In the parking lot, we see a car that has backed into another, almost at a side angle. Laura said that the person who was in the car ran away as soon as the accident happened. The car, however, was still there with its engine running, so we were all wondering what the hell was going on. My mom goes downstairs to check the damage when she sees a figure standing outside Susan's building. It was a man that she had never seen before. The next morning, my mom runs into Susan and they start talking about what happened. The unknown man from the night before soon appears. He introduces himself as Eric, and apparently, he was Susan's new boyfriend. It turns out he was not involved in the accident at all. He had just come out to see what was going on, like my mother did. Prior to meeting him, Susan had told Eric about our family and that I was studying to become a therapist. When I met him for the first time, this topic came up and I confirmed. He starts going on and on about all the similar work he's done and thanks me for my service. He begins giving me names of places I can go to for shadowing hours and other resources for finding jobs. Finally, he tells me to use his name when I'm applying for jobs and that he could get me a position at a psych center that he apparently helped found which I did look up, but could not corroborate anything he said. He was very insistent that I use his name. Later on, he talks to my sister. My sister really likes to watch movies. He told her that he once had a small speaking role in one of those teen book-to-film adaptations we used to obsess over. So, of course, we go home and look up his name. Nowhere on the internet was his name even mentioned in regards to being involved with that film. So we just dropped the movie title and looked up his name. It wasn't a movie we found. He apparently had been infamous in our town for years as someone who was known as the Child Biter. He earned this moniker by biting an eight-year-old girl. It didn't end there. There were reports of him stalking his victim and her family afterward. According to the records, only a few years later, he committed the same crime against another young girl. We were freaking out, and we text to Laura, who's kind of our gossip buddy. She has two young kids, so she was furious that a man with an actual criminal record was allowed to move in. We later found out that he wasn't on the lease, but we were still concerned because there was a lot of kids that lived in this apartment complex. The question came up of whether or not to tell Susan. We debated over this, but decided that it was the best thing to do so. My mom sends Susan a long text message about what we discovered about Eric. Five minutes later, she calls us and tells us not to believe in all the articles and court records. She stated that he had pled guilty because he was 
politically framed by one of the girl's fathers who was running for some small office or something. Of course, all of this was complete bullshit. Susan just did not want to admit that her new boyfriend is a freak who apparently has a thing for biting children. Susan demands to know why everyone is so concerned, and we tell her it's pretty obvious why. Later on, she knocks on Laura's door, asking her if she's concerned as well. Laura pretty much made the same points we did, about how there's kids everywhere, and she's trying to be a good parent. Susan just turns around and leaves, just like that. Unfortunately, there were a few families in that complex that allowed their children to just wander around without any kind of supervision, unless me and my sister happened to be outside. Once the word got out about Eric, there wasn't a single kid outside. A few days later, Maddie comes running up to us. This poor girl has the worst luck in the world and always manages to get the attention of creepy men. She tells me and my sister about a nice guy at the pool who gave them M&Ms. A few minutes later, Eric strolls up with his bathing suit on, and Maddie tells us it was him. We avoid eye contact, but he slows down as he passes us. We warn Maddie to stay away from him, and that he was a very dangerous man that did not belong here. Another time we were visiting a friend who lived in Susan's building. As soon as we enter the hallway, we run into Eric. He grins and begins making small talk. We awkwardly excuse ourselves and go to our friend's apartment. Once we were inside, we kept looking out the window to see Eric standing by his car, staring back at us. Sometimes we go pick up Maddie from the bus stop whenever her parents ask us to. The bus stop happens to be right next to the pool and guess who he saw wearing a pair of sunglasses sitting in a lounge chair almost every single day. Mr. Childbiter himself. Now all of us are pissed off at this point. Not only at Eric, but at Susan as well for bringing this predator into our community. We contact the property manager who said that she couldn't do anything because he wasn't registered as living there. But if he stayed longer than two weeks, Susan would be charged for it. The two week period soon came to an end and after that, we never saw him again. I'm still stumped as to why the hell he told me to use his name as a reference when a simple search of his name shows all of his history. Again, I have to stress that we did live in a nice area in a small suburban town. I don't know what it was about that apartment complex that attracted so many weirdos and criminals. Maybe it's some kind of unspoken agreement for them to all gather there, and we just didn't know about it. These last series of events happened over several months in 2016. Whenever we talk about this place, we call it the apartment complex from hell. My sister and I were still into the hoverboard craze back then, and we would ride them around in the parking lot. This is how we met Savannah. She was around our age and lived in our building. One day she asked if she could hang out with us, and we were happy to make a new friend. So we said yes. We hung out outside the complex at a nearby park. When it got dark, we began making up ghost stories. It turns out that Savannah was kind of a paranormal connoisseur. As a side note, I didn't actually believe in any of this stuff and I still don't. You can assume that every time I mention something paranormal, it's hyperbole. As we're walking home, a light in one of the apartment hallways began flickering. I joked and said it was a spirit trying to communicate with us. Savannah then said, Flash once for yes, twice for no. And we started messing around a bit. My sister and I saw it as just harmless fun. The next day, Savannah comes up to us, very excited. She informed us that the spirit we had met last night told her its name was Kieran. And she said she returned to that hallway later that night alone, and 
talked to it. This was the first time it occurred to us that Savannah just might be insane. She really believed in this stuff. Our aunt had given us an old Ouija board as a joke the year before, and we thought Savannah might like it. When we brought it up to her, she lit up like a Christmas tree and said that she wanted to try to communicate with Kieran. We were really bored, so we figured why not. We huddled up in the hallway connecting the apartments and put our hands on the board. We kept getting random letters that made no sense, but eventually, Savannah's questions were directed to Kieran. We felt her moving the planchette and called her out on it. She got very angry and said that we couldn't prove anything. She took her hand off the planchette and it no longer moved. She just huffed and insisted that it wasn't her. Over the next several weeks, we mostly did normal stuff with her, but she kept going on and on about ghosts and Ouija boards until we finally caved in and played it again. This time we were introduced to a new ghost, Evan. I hope you're keeping up. We knew that it was Savannah moving the planchette the entire time, but we were curious about this new story that Savannah was going to come up with. So this Evan was a spirit, a demon to be more specific. He was around our age and wanted to be free from a stronger demon controlling him. And who was this all-powerful demon? Kieran, of course. Savannah's parents called her inside and conveniently, Evan had to go too. He told us, <clears throat> she told us, he had to protect us against Kieran. And Savannah commented on how cute it was for him to offer. <laughs> I was not ready for a trip to crazy town today. A few days later, Savannah tells us that she has a boyfriend. We were happy for her until she told us his name, Evan. So we're now wondering what the hell she's talking about. She can't be suggesting that she's now dating a make-believe demon named Evan. But yes, that is exactly what's happening here. She explains that while sleeping over at another friend's house, something had pulled her shorts off while she was sleeping. She woke up and heard Evan's voice. Then he'd visit her in her dreams and ask her out on a date, something like that. So she decides to go full-blown batshit insane and says yes. Me and my sister were floored. What is wrong with you? We're not talking about this demon stuff anymore. After this, the disturbing part of Savannah's personality began to show its ugly head. She became very possessive. When she would see us with someone else, she would text us non-stop, asking why we hadn't invited her. We tried our best to keep our distance, but she lived on the ground floor and would sit there and watch out her window for us to come outside. She latched onto us like a parasite. We didn't know much about her home life, but she always seemed to be troubled. We noticed one day that she had scars on her wrists and talked about running away from home. Savannah would randomly show up holding her hand out, saying that Evan was holding her hand. She looked at random things and laughed when no one was talking because Evan had told her a funny joke. Once she made us feel her cheek and then told us afterwards that it was warm from Evan kissing her. This apartment complex was starting to turn into Arkham Asylum. One day my sister and I were bored from her talking to Evan and we wanted to have some fun. I texted my mom to call my phone from a blocked number and play creepy sounds. Looking back, this was a terrible idea. I should not have fueled the fire like that, but at the time I just thought it was funny. My mom made the call and I put it on speaker. Savannah is living for it. My mom even took it a step further and threw a banana off our third story balcony, which landed right next to us. Savannah said it was a sign from Kieran. We had no idea what this would start. We were about to tell her that it was a prank, but her mom called her inside. 
She found us again the next day, and I come clean about the prank. She laughed and said that there was no way we could have done that. I told her. No, I literally talked my mom into doing it. Savannah told us that yellow objects, like the banana, was a sign of the devil, and seeing them meant the devil was hunting you. This is all she talked about for a while. Eventually things went back to normal, until Autumn moved in. Autumn and Savannah connected instantly because of their history with depression. Autumn was a few years younger than us, but had one hell of a past. This included spending time at psychiatric facilities and violence towards her classmates and family. Autumn claimed that she heard demons speaking to her at night. And just like that, all of this paranormal nonsense started up again. Savannah felt threatened by Autumn and felt that she had to one-up her. She told her that Evan was her ghost brother. I immediately interjected when I heard this. Hold on, I thought you said he was your boyfriend. She laughed and said, No, that's gross. He's my brother. Her story had completely changed. She was now dating another demon named Jacob, and they were engaged. She even showed us a ring to prove it. Over the next week, it was literally a match between them to see who was the most darkest and most involved with the spiritual world or whatever. In a move to one-up Autumn, Savannah drew a giant pentagram in the parking lot with a piece of chalk. Her parents found out, and she blamed it on Autumn. Savannah began learning witchcraft, and at this point we mostly avoided her. But she would ask us to do things like bring her holy water so she could summon her familiar. From that point on, she insisted that she was a fire witch and walked around wearing all black with Halloween makeup on her face. She and Autumn frequently snuck out together and occasionally we would see cop cars outside of her apartment building. My sister and I were trying to avoid them both but now we would get novel long text messages from the both of them, asking if we were hanging out with other people, especially boys. Once they saw us get back home, they stood in the parking lot pretending to be possessed. Autumn also cut off all of her hair and started claiming that she was going to kill her teacher. My sister and I didn't take this seriously, but given her history, we probably should have. Keep in mind, the Psychosis Olympics was still going on. Savannah began wandering around the complex and telling other tenants about crimes that she had committed or was going to commit. She even told us that when she first saw us outside with the hoverboards, she prayed for them to blow up. Once again, we see police cars outside of our apartment building. The officers were wearing jackets that said they were from the Juvenile Justice Department. Savannah's mother pulled me and my sister and our mom aside to explain what was going on. Apparently they had discovered that she was talking to a man online and trying to hire him to murder her parents. After that, Savannah continued begging us to hang out with her, even inviting herself over to spend the night. We avoided her at all costs. She kept following us everywhere, shadowing us. But eventually, it all just sort of died down, when Autumn finally moved out. Savannah's family left shortly after that. Since then, she has begun doing work at horse stables and has graduated from high school. I really hope she's in a better place and more stable. My family has since moved out as well. There were just too many bad memories at these apartments. Our new place is a lot more peaceful and quiet and we hope it stays that way.